Brandon will now we'll invite each of our panelists to come down. Um, have a seat. <laughs> and at this time, we'll uh, open up the panel to questions. Anybody got a question? <laughs> Nobody. Yes. Uh, I have a question for Alex. So you said um, because of the climate change, uh, we might have to change how we think about water in terms of being a livelihood, right? And because of the law that we have on this in Texas, it might mean that the state should pay the farmer for you know, the owners of the land in order to get the water or job to, uh, let's say, uh, limit the use of water. Now, isn't it possible just to change the law without paying anything? I mean, is, isn't this something that is like, you know, the state jurisdiction to change the laws and not pay anything? Yeah, so that's a great question. Texas is the only state in the union that still has the rule of cap capture for groundwater. Um, I think Maine actually has some rule of capture as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so groundwater law is notoriously convoluted. There are some states that use a mixture of theories. But for Texas, um, the, the water politics for the legislature of Texas, uh, our chancellor, our Duncan, was, was, a, was a real leader in the 90s uh, about that issue. Um, if we put aside the political infeasibility of a law that would then restrict or remove property rights from groundwater, I think that law would still effectuate uh, what we call a regulatory taking, because it's a property right that was once recognized and was recognized since 1904 in the East case. Um, and anytime that property right is taken, if it's taken in, in a significant way, the state would have to pay for the difference in, in that scenario and the current scenario, where you have groundwater conservation districts limiting landowners' funding, when the landowner files a claim for a taking of the property, the groundwater conservation district pays them, which is not the state. Those are two, two separate entities. And groundwater conservation districts generally don't have their own land funds available to pay any of those judgments. The judgment that recently came down in the Bragg case I think it was $2.4 million that the groundwater conservation district owed the landowners for telling, for curtailing their uh, use of water to grow, to grow the corn crop. Um, so that that money would still be, it would come from a different source, but the landowners would still need to be compensated. And I, I think it's hard for me to imagine legislators running on that platform of costing the state millions of dollars and also taking away people's private property rights. That's a surefire way to get you kicked out of office. So my point here is, um, yeah, you're right. That could happen. And I, I might even think that would be a good idea in some respects. But um, I think it's really unlikely. The, the emphasis in Texas has really been on local control and groundwater conservation districts. <coughs> Well, so, so that kind of begs the next obvious question. Chuck, you showed the state of the aquifer and how they want 50% left in 50 years, but where are you at with 23%? 24%. In how many years? And so we have, we have another year to add to that spot to run down another 2%. So that's after us, so 2007. 2007. Yeah. So that's eight years, basically, right. or seven right. years plus, plus the next year. So, what can be done in the current regulatory environment? Is it just going to be a disaster? Like, are they just going to hit the wall? There's going to be no water left, and everybody's going to start screaming? Or what's going to happen? Because clearly the plan isn't working. And that's a question for everybody. <laughs> I mean, I'll, so I'll say this. Uh, so having talked with a number of regulators from groundwater conservation districts, given the, the Bragg case that I just mentioned, the $2.8 million judgment, a lot of them are lawyers, and they are not fools, they're not going to regulate anybody's funding um, because they know it will trigger a claim. Uh, so I think their incentive to attempt to regulate is zero, um, which means 
And that's assuming that there is a groundwater conservation district in there. Because a lot of areas in Texas don't have one. And so there's no, even, there, there's no purported authority to really do that. So I think you have a circumstance where there's no practical authority. And there's also no legal authority in some other jurisdictions. So that, then the incentive comes from individual farmers uh, that want to, that, that purely use economic or economic rationale. I can grow, I can make more money by using less water in these ways. And so then it's incumbent upon offsetting those costs and providing that technology free of charge. But I think even then it begs the question if you can give them technology to grow more crops with less water, then they're just going to use the same amount of water but grow the same amount or grow more crops. So uh, I'm, uh, today I'm not super hopeful of uh, how, we, how we protect the aquifer, but I think that's why panels like this are really important to sort of address the issue. I was not talking about that. Sorry. So you, you, had, you, had, you had your hand up. Yeah. So I have a question, but I'll just follow. So how does legislature itself, when local communities come in and say, this is what we're going to do, we say, okay, I'm not going to let fracking take in any more water there. There was, there was a case last year, I think, when the local communities did that, and the legislature actually come in, comes in and says, House Bill 40, which said that, no, you cannot, get, you don't get to do things like that. Right. So you, this is their water. So how is the legislature going to stop doing that and actually let the communities handle it? Well, they won't. I mean, they won't. Um, so, so I have a colleague is writing an article exactly about that issue. Uh, other states are, are talking about uh, Florida just considered a, a ban on uh, hydraulic fracture of dams. So this is the state telling local communities, you don't have the right to ban that type of activity in the community. That's, that's what happened in Texas. So Denton, I, I think that Denton could have done a number of different things to limit hydraulic fracture when there were some city limits. Uh, they didn't have to do this. Um, but they did, and you see the response from the state of Texas. One city and that effectuates this ban of the state of Texas thumbs up, right? It says nobody's going to use to do this. But I think under most groundwater conservation districts, uh, fracture uh, oil and gas production don't need a permit. So <clears throat> they don't need a permit to get, to get water anywhere. They're exempt. And how much water does a hydraulic fracture operation use per year? Uh, like I don't know, per day, but each frac is millions of gallons of water. Millions of gallons of water. So, which is several acre feet, depending on how you're talking about. Well, let me let me just go ahead yeah. and connect with that. The reason the districts didn't take on oil and gas, you know, decades ago, is because the oil and gas use of water was temporary, you know, compared to what you know, south and east of the country. And you're getting farmer too. So they're kind of in, they're out. That is that issue. And the other thing, I don't know if there's anybody in here who's who's been a landowner who made money off the oil and gas business, is when they pay for the water they produce on their land, they pay only over 50 cents per dollar per barrel. How much a barrel is? 42 gallons. That's a whole lot of uh, money per acre foot, you know, for example. So, oh, you were, uh, Alex was talking about the government <coughs> taking, and they would have to pay for it. Well, their oil and gas business has a, an economy that allows their taking to be paid for, and then we don't have to pay for it. You know, and we're, and we're buying the, the products. So that, that'll have, that all has worked itself out in the past. Uh, now we have a very different, now, and there's always been water use in, in oil and gas production. There's also a lot of water production in oil and gas production in terms of the salty water that gets stuck back in the ground, and we're trying to think about what can we do uh, to scallop some of that issue. But there's a lot of uh, challenges to that. I guess also fracturing is new, it's been around for decades as well. It's the, the recent uh, proliferation of the technology in $100 a barrel oil. Uh, Juxtaposition of those things made things really different. So it's a, um, it's a very interesting situation. You think, I guess that's the thing. Part of the challenge of dealing with water is what units you use to describe it. We can make big numbers or small numbers depending upon uh, whichever unit we want to we want to stick on it and, and which comparison we want to make. But it is uh, these these I, I, what I think is is best is that people are talking about this more than they have had before because of the the shared resource and how it impacts people in some of these ways. You had a question? Yeah, so we were talking about how some <coughs> areas don't have regulatory pressures to put out in the school for water extraction, but we've been talking like Ugalala stops at the border of Texas. Um, it doesn't. 
happens in the future when Kansas or Nebraska feels like Texas citizens have taken too much of their share and are now causing damages to their state's citizens? I can handle that one. They don't connect geologically. <laughs> <laughs> we are totally isolated geologically by the Pecos River and the Columbia River. And therefore, we're mining our water where it's safe for us to recharge the stream that we just put up. Well, Nebraska has most of the water we have of Iowa, so she's had some problems. Cool. I mean, she's a cornhouse. She's a cornhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm nice. I know. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's details, though. I mean, yeah. you're talking about the difference between Texas and Kansas. That's one thing. You're talking about the difference between Kansas and what's next to a Colorado that are from the same aquifer. Right. That's, that's the not as, not, They're not the same as Texas. What we do right, is Texas doesn't saying. affect that. Right, that's what I'm saying. Who cares? I mean, let's talk about different states. The point is, the point is that you have a, an entity, a resource that expands over multiple states. Right. So, so a great example of, of that is the current Supreme Court case between Tennessee and Mississippi. They share, as I've read all of the hydrologic reports, as best as my lawyer brain can understand them, they share the Sparta sand off geologically. Hydrologically, the same aquifer. Is that right, Dr. Brandon? That's what Dr. Campan is. That's what Dr. Campan is. Exactly what I'm saying. Uh, and so the question is, can Memphis pump water that would have gone to Mississippi? And how do we figure that out when both states, which are artificial political boundaries, have different conceptions of who owns the same water? So it makes no sense, right? But we only now know that it makes no sense because of science. We do have the ability to model these situations. Like People don't always <coughs> want to take the time to do that, and also it takes it often takes years for water to move the, the distances people are thinking about those issues. Even in Texas, you know, the completion we had here started to be noted uh, pretty much within a decade or two after uh, after World War II when our use really went up. Um, and it was part of the deal was when people originally started pumping water out of wells, they didn't really have any way to know about how much water the aquifer could. Yield. Uh, so they just put as big a pump as they could and well, until the well went dry. Oops, I'll turn it off and I'll turn it back on. So the, our understanding is now the same has, has uh, been behind people's uh, uh, use of the resources that they have. Hopefully we'll, we'll do better with our next generation. And as, as Ken would say, Ken, where's Ken <laughs> up there, yeah. that people's perspective on underground water is often even mythological, right? I mean, it's this kind of mythological pool of water that sometimes comes and sometimes doesn't, and what does science have to say about that? <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. You had a question, sir. Well, I think Jugs Button addressed this very well when they started the, the underground municipal area areas and said that Texas needs two laws, one for east of I-35, one for west of I-35. But the problem remains still that Comanche Springs was pumped dry by a former governor, and that precedent remains with us. And I, I like that you say we need to move forward, but how do we do that? Yeah, I mean, that's, if anyone has an answer, <laughs> you will make a lot of money in Texas. Uh, that's the question, right? I mean, the, the stories that we've been telling ourselves are that the past is going to be uh, like the future, right? And now we know the past is not the past. That was a great term for it. Uh, now what do we do, right? Change is really hard, and sacrifice is really hard. But I, I like your idea of a lawn example, right? Like, why do we have lawns? Why do we have lawns? Right? It's silly. If you think about it, that's the reason. If you have some other reason for it, that's fine. But because we've always done it that way, it's, it's, not, a good, it's not a good reason now that we are faced with scarcity. It's fine for me. One thing I want to mention to there's two of us that grew up near Comanche Springs <laughs> is actually when we stop using the water so much, it comes back. It's flowing right now. Yes, <laughs> I was fixing to say. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we're excited about that. Yeah, so that's that's part of the the interest in terms of how we when we understand systems and also when it rains and also when we move on to other concerns, there can be other impacts. And what we hope, what, what we wish we had, I guess, those are some of the resources is that we had. More ability to observe, you know, our systems, uh, especially groundwater, since it's so, so mysterious and occult to to see. That's a legal term. The, uh, <laughs> uh, to to watch how things move relative to the, the different uh, impacts of recharge and rainfall and, and, and our use. 
And uh, one of the things that's in the way of our understanding our storage is, is because we haven't had to talk so much about how much we use the water, but that's coming next, that's happening more. So we'll know about, more about our checkbook than we know how to get the checks on. And you can see some of that in the smaller scale of natural resources because um, so when I worked out in Arizona, in northern Arizona, there was a group out there called the Diablo Trust, which was a group of ranchers and environmentalists and politicians and scientists and so forth trying to figure out how to better, better manage rangelands. And because they changed the way they did things, they started having the springs, like you're talking about Comanche Springs, start flowing again. And these were historical springs that had been dry for a while because of the way we were managing our land. And if you would do things more responsibly and think about it, you can bring some of these things back. And so your access is a little better, at least for the short term. Oh, yeah. So I know that um, surface water and groundwater are different. They're considered separate even though they're all part of the hydrologic cycle. How, what happens when groundwater pumping affects surface water in terms of surface water rights, as well as in terms of wetland delineation that has a, an impact as well. And I was wondering if you guys could talk about that a little bit as well. Go first. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, there's, we, we recognize the interaction of, of surface water and groundwater in places where people are dependent on springs, and especially the Aquifer area, you know, that's, that's kind of been our lead place for that. And the blessing there is that uh, when things go dry, they can bounce back quickly because they just close enough to the coast of the hurricanes help them more often than they do out here. So the, the flash flood situation all those things are in place. Um, reality though, though, in terms of the management schemes, we really haven't quite gotten there to, to put them together. You know, the people that have shown us how to do this are up in Nebraska and uh, Kansas and Colorado where they share the flat uh, Arkansas River. It depends on what state you're in. Said Arkansas, said Arkansas. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, where they have spent so much time in court that they do have monitoring uh, programs in place, watching the the, uh, the water and plants and animals uh, to keep up with that in those locations. Uh, I think this science makes the law look pretty bad, right? They came up with bees. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> So, but now that we know more about how things are connected, I think when you talk about, when you look at the states that are trying to harmonize the way they, they deal with groundwater and surface water, you see uh, trends towards watershed management and incorporating things that you do into principles that actual regulators and politicians are using. And that's, I think that's the right trend. That's the right way to go so that we think about ecosystem more in the big picture rather than as separate buckets which don't really interact or absolutely don't. Um, so I think that's a really that's a really unpleasant interaction in a lot of states, but in some states like Washington and Oregon can can be better. Uh, but they are farther along in that in that evolution than Texas or and then Wetlands themselves add a layer of complexity that doesn't get understood by, say, terrestrial biologists or aquatic biologists and so forth, because it's not always it's not always connected directly to the groundwater. It's not always flowing from the groundwater to the wetland or the wetland to the groundwater. And so in the modeling for that that Dr. Rainwater was talking about, you have to have those connections in there, and it's not obvious and when you're coming in from outside you're not going to think about that it's a wetland there's water okay you do it and that's not the way it works somebody else has a question yes ma'am i went to a groundwater management area meeting a couple of months ago and they had a consultant that uh, was modeling uh, drawdown and under different use scenarios and what he said from what i could understand what he said is that it didn't really matter how much water we used out of the aquifer because there was plenty of recharge. <laughs> their consult was that my uncle? <laughs> <laughs> I have an uncle that did for water drilling in Florida, and he was like, "No, there's still as much water down here as there was 
you know, when I started, I'm like, yeah, but it's walking around on the surface. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to know more about the context of that comment. Yeah, know which so which rock was on the beach? Yeah. Oh, the lava? And which, and yeah. what, what location, which GMA were you visiting? One two. Or two. Two. It's down here. <laughs> two? Was there any salt that they got? I think, was it Bill Hutchinson? Uh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> So why is water as a natural resource and not treated the way uh, other ones are as far as extraction goes? Um, so for mining, companies have to pay the federal government some fees for, for the mining, for what they extract, and similar for timber and so forth. Why did water end up a separate category? Well, in Texas, it's in the, it's in the same category. It's, uh, it's a uh, resource that can be cut off. It's, uh, in other jurisdictions, water is owned by the state and leased or are allowed to be used by, by individuals. So they don't own the water, they have the right to use the water. It's called a user periphery, right? So in Texas, I mean, the, the rule of capture stems from one of the gas law and how Texas is treated. Law. They just, the, the court in, sim, in simplified fashion said they're both under the ground, we'll treat them the same. In other jurisdictions, they've said, yeah, they're both under the ground, but the point of an oil and gas reservoir is to deplete it efficiently and use it. The point of a, a groundwater aquifer is not to deplete it. So let's think about what property rules encourage sustainable use or limited use rather than encourage extraction. So it really is a different, it's a different basis from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So in Texas, we definitely treat the same in other jurisdictions. They do. And also, there's a societal perspective as well. Because water is something we cannot live without. We have to have it. This is not, we can get an alternative substance. Beer does not work without water. Um, you, you have to have oh. the water. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one, one more quick question. So, to add to this, how does pricing of water play into all of this? Means, uh, uh, what does the panel think about how water is priced in Texas or how water is priced in the United States, which makes it a resource that is so cheaply disposable or cheaply usable? <laughs> uh, which, how, how do we go about changing it? You got to own it all. <laughs> That's part of the deal. The people that use the most water already own it. So that's, that's kind of a moot question for that. The municipalities, uh, okay, I'm on the local water advisory commission. We advise the city council and the mayor about water rates in terms of how, how those can be used. And you know, you know, Lubbock has a sizable debt for its 100 year water plan in terms of how we're going to supply water from multiple sources to, you know, into the future for several decades. And also have a uh, plan for potential reuse and other things that could happen when the clock requires that. The uh, challenge is, you know, you gotta you gotta pay the debt, and so you have a connection fee, you know, to have have a water meter, and you gotta pay for the use in terms of how much water you use. If you use more, I'll pay more. If you use less, and that kind of thing. So there needs to be a balance. But what's been happening is, uh, if you well, the advisory commission tries to make that make sense financially. The elected officials sometimes want to say they're they're changing the, the, the total amount of fees by lowering something. So most recently they want to lower the connection fee, but the use fee not. Because they still gotta pay the same amount because they gotta pay the bills. Well, if we encourage conservation under that situation, people use less water because they won't be able to pay their bills and they'll end up like Austin with a couple years ago. So there has to be uh, 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 Depending on who's using which water and who's paying for it, we got to make it make sense based on which bank we got the money from. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's some challenges to this. All right, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, <laughs> um,